All right, it looks like uh, some of our panelists are starting to join. So we're getting our full contingent here. Thank you to our panelists who are here and thank you so much to our audience. We'll go ahead and get started with introductions. This is going to be a conversation with professors Annamale, Cody, Malarvi, Jayanth, and Constantine Nakassis on Bernard Bates' Protestant textuality and the Thelma Modern. My name is Tulisi Seishin. I am a marketing manager here with the Seminary Co-op Bookstores in Chicago. Our stores were founded in 1961, and in 2009, they became the first not-for-profit bookstores dedicated solely to the mission of bookselling. That mission recognizes bookstores as fundamental civic institutions, and it allows us to work with like-minded partners on events like this one. Tonight, we are delighted to be partnering with the Committee on Southern Asian Studies and the Center for the Study of Communication and Society at the University of Chicago. I'll go ahead and introduce our presenters now, and of course, give a word about the author of our text. Protestant Textuality in the Thelma Modern was written by Bernard Bate in whose memory this event is being held. Professor Bate was associate professor and head of studies in the anthropology department at Yale College. A linguistic anthropologist by training, Bate devoted his scholarly life to the study of Thummer political oratory. A mentor to generations of linguistic anthropologists and students of Thummer, Bate's teaching and writing were both centrally concerned with what he called the poesy of language, that palpable quality of speech that lends it world-making capacities. His second major research project brought him to the archives in both Chennai, Thummer Nadu, and Jatna, Sri Lanka, in an effort to understand the origins of political speech in Thummer. In a series of articles published in the Indian Economic and Social History Review and Comparative Studies in Society and History, along with a book chapter in the volume Ethical Life in South Asia, they explored how Protestant missionary efforts introduced a new kind of public address that fused with the aesthetic of Thummel poetics to form modern political oratory in the 20, early 20th century. Professor Annamale is a linguist trained in India um, at Annamale University and the United States at the University of Chicago, specializing in Thummel grammar and semantics. He served for over 20 years as professor and director of the Central Institute of Indian Languages in Mysore, India, where he studied indigenous languages, their documentation, their use in education, the use of language in society, especially in education, and the study of language diversity and its consequences. Until last academic year, he taught Thummer language and literature at the University of Chicago for 11 years, and before that, for five years at Yale University alongside Bernard Bate. Francis Cody is an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology and the Asian Institute at the University of Toronto. Saw a strong Toronto contingent here tonight. His research focuses on language, media, and politics in Southern India. He first brought these interests to bear on a study of citizenship, literacy, and social movement politics in rural Tamil Nadu. Cody's more recent research theorizes populism and transformations of political publicity through Tamil and English news media. Taken as a whole, his work contributes to the transdisciplinary project of elaborating critical social theories of mass mediation and politics in the post-colonial world. Malarari Jayant is a historian of colonial South Asia. She is due to begin postdoctoral research as the research fellow in slavery and its impacts at King's College in Cambridge in the academic year 21-22. She holds a doctorate in South Asian languages and civilizations from the University of Chicago. Costas Nakassis is an associate professor of anthropology, affiliated faculty in the departments of comparative human development and cinema and media studies, and chair of the Committee on Southern Asian Studies. He's the author of the 2016 monograph, Doing Style, Youth and Mass Mediation in South India from University of Chicago Press, and is currently working on a new book manuscript on the cinema of Thelma Nadu, entitled On Screen, Off Screen, coming from University of Toronto Press. He is the organizer of the Chicago Thummer Forum, an annual workshop devoted to Thummer language and culture, for which Bernard Bate provided its name, and of which he is a regular and founding member alongside Annamare and Francis Cody. And now to our moderator. Susan Gall is the May and Sydney G. Metzl Distinguished Service Professor of Anthropology, Linguistics, and of Social Science in the college here at the University of Chicago. She's a pioneer in the field of linguistic anthropology, writing numerous seminal texts on language, ideology, politics, and discourse, most recently with Judith Irvine, Science of Difference, Language and Ideology and Social Life, which we were pleased to be able to celebrate here at the Seminary Co-op. We are delighted to have you all virtually with us this evening. And a final note about format, there will be time for audience questions at the end of the program. So please make use of the chat function, um, which most of you have now familiarized yourselves with, and use that to submit questions during the event. Um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and check in to see that our moderator has arrived. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes. All right. I'll kick it over to you, Susan. 
<laughs> Thanks very much, Thasi, for that introduction. And um, I think what uh, most people know, what, pe what everyone looks like, um, but I wonder if, um, well, you can identify yourselves when you start speaking. I think that would be the easiest. So I'm uh, Sue Gal, and it's a pleasure both to meet the people that I don't already know and to connect again with those that I know really well. Um, I too was a, a, a and, and actually to welcome everybody on this large Zoom call. Um, I too was a colleague of, of Bernard Bate, who we will call Barney, I think, for the for the rest of this discussion, as we all did. And um, I admired his work, and um, he was a really warm and, and a lovely man to, um, uh, to be um, uh, together with and to, be, to talk to. And um, I admired his work and was devastated, as was everyone else, I think, by the, his sudden death in 2016. Um, Barney was a University of College, a University of Chicago uh, graduate, PhD. I mentioned that since that's where we are. Many of us are sitting, and uh, he taught at Yale um, and US um, uh, for many years. The book we are discussing today is his second and posthumous one, edited by some of his friends, the ones who have just been named. Um, and uh, I want to thank his friends to begin with for what I think is a real gift to scholarship. You have done a good deed, an incredibly good deed. Some people have told me that you, they would like to nominate you all for sainthood, for um, in, uh, engaging in um, this kind of really uh, community uh, advancing, uh, uh, enhancing uh, work. And I, I know that it is really quite a bit of work that was necessary. So I just read the book in the last few days and was fascinated uh, by the historical moment he sets before us and moved actually quite a, very moved by the vivid detail and um, <clears throat> deeply impressed by the subtle, profound uh, theoretical significance of what, with your help, uh, Barney has given us. I rush to say that I'm not a South Asianist. Um, and I actually expected uh, this book to be interesting, but really distant. Instead, it actually speaks directly to my own concerns, the abstract contingent relationship between genre textuality and politics as occurring really anywhere in the world can be illuminated. Uh, by uh, reading this book. Um, it opens up, I think, entirely new ways of thinking about publics as not only print mediated, but also oral, oratorical, poetic in particular ways, and shows us how oral genres are embodied means of political mobilization, or rather embodied differently than, um, than, than print was. And in another aspect, let's us see how realms of or domains that we now call religion and politics are demarcated um, ideologically and emerge historically. These are really very big contributions. Um, uh, the revisionist history tells the emergence of Tom Nash consciousness via political oratory is uh, fascinating. Um, <clears throat> how it came out, uh, this is one of the things one appreciates most about it. He shows us how it came out of contingent agentive bringing together of two vastly different textualities and semiotic ideologies. One, the Protestant genre of sermon making uh, Protestant homilies uh, based on Western privileging of denotation reference. I think you're all very familiar with this one, reason as, per, as persuasion. And aim to reach, I think this is a crucial one, potential believers imagined as universal people, um, not divided by class, gender, caste, language, and so on. The other textuality many of you are also probably also very familiar with uh, is the famous South Asian textuality of embodied ritual speech embedded in lots of other media, such as dance and song, often in multiple languages, often fixed, limited to elite practitioners and in closed temple spaces, persuading by emotional sensual means. And these are two materialities I would like to think of them as. So how did the uh, confluence of these um, uh, two very different textual practices produce not only a mass political agency, as opposed to a spiritual agency, right? It was something to think about, but a specifically Tamil democratic public, 
the nice words that he introduces that I think uh, will be very useful to many, many people are things like infrastructure of communication that enables and textualizes political action. So in short, it's a fabulous book. I really must congratulate all of you. It's, it's, it's just fascinating. And um, everyone interested in language and politics and media, um, and who isn't interested in those things these days, really should read it. Uh, it's enormously timely, exactly because we're all, I think, obsessed with just those three things at this moment, not of course, not in Tamil Nadu, not in India, but right here in the US as well. Um, and so although it's rooted in South Asia, I think tonight it's best to talk about the ways in which it isn't just South Asia, just, <laughs> it isn't South Asia um, uh, singly that this book speaks to, but very much, um, much of the world um, and with larger theoretical concerns, questions and answers that will be of a central concern, central interest to many of the people in this room, no matter where it is that their field work and their linguistic work uh, takes them. So, and let me also once again, congratulate the four uh, so-called editors. And I know very well that you've done a lot more than whatever editing is, you've done a great deal more than that. Um, uh, the uh, Barney's writings and notes, uh, putting them together, um, uh, is was probably not a very simple matter. The book reads beautifully. Um, its argument is complex and yet clear. Uh, it's continuous and seamless. I kept wanting to look for the themes, you know. Uh, but also, it's true that you have um, really extensive editorial commentary and um, uh, machinery, which is very very helpful. Um, so. What I'd like, as I, I congratulate you, um, I'm grateful to you for doing this. I, I would have been very sad if this had been lost to scholarship. So I thank you, but I think everyone in the room will. And I think in, in, um, in more um, extensive ways, it is a gift to scholarship, as I have said. So I have a couple of questions to get quickly to, um, where's my clock? Here it is. Um, to get quickly to, uh, to the discussion of the book. Um, uh, I, I'll ask one question just to start off the conversation and please take it any way you want. Um, I have one final question to ask because I would really like you to talk about how you did this, how you came to do it, but it would be, and how you have what kind of division of labor you had and so on, um, because I think it will be interesting to everyone, but that should be our last question. First, we should discuss the book. I hope you all agree with that ordering. Uh, so, um, let me open it up with one question, but please feel free to just move on to whatever else is interesting to you. And then we will open it up at the, uh, in the last half hour to questions from the audience. Um, so it, this strikes me as a deeply, this is my first thing. This, this strikes me as a deeply original and integrative book. Um, he rethinks uh, a huge number of things and brings them together, which is what is very impressive about it. So there's the Anderson, Taylor, Habermas, languages, publics, and nationalism, which is completely overturned, basically. <laughs> These three guys forgot that most people who were becoming nationalized couldn't read. And that's kind of an amazing realization. Um, the book notes that print versus platform is simplistic dichotomy, and as he works on that, unified publics called into being in other ways. That's, we need to think about that. On the other hand, he connects politics to ritual, as in the work of Tambaya and Silverstein, though those two scholars didn't do what he's doing. They did not follow politics in the same kind of uh, processual way. Um, uh, then, of course, there's the thinking about poetics and poesy as in Jakobsen and Friedrich, who wrote less about, maybe not at all about nation making, except of course, um, I like Ike per, 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 perhaps. Um, and they wrote very little about language making. Um, and of course, um, Barney is very concerned with the making of a new Tamil. And I, I personally, as someone who cares about that, found that to be fascinating. And then these, um, these great predecessors could not have thought about Protestant semiotic ideology and its abstractions. Um, that was Weber's problem, right? But Weber didn't write about language at all. 
Uh, nor was something that I think is so important is that the way that these abstractions, these uh, uh, Protestant semiotic ideologies and its abstractions could be appropriated, intertwined with the vastly different aesthetics of language and performance of other cultural traditions, in this case, um, South Asian ones. So with that um, uh, uh, introduction, simply for those who have not yet read the book, um, how do you see the key um, conceptual contributions in placing language at the center of political mobilization? And it is the case that that has been done, but he's doing it in a very different way, I think. And so I ask any one of the four editors who would like to jump in, um, it's not my job to call on you, <laughs> I hope. Um, to, to think about what do you see as the key conceptual contributions, not necessarily linked to South Asia, um, by putting language in this particular way at the center of political mobilization, not as text, not as artifacts, a text as, as, as um, writing, not as writing and reading. So please, someone. Um, I, I'll start. I'm Francis Cody, one of the co-editors. I teach at the University of Toronto, and um, thank you for that amazingly gracious and, and beautiful synthesis um, of an introduction to the book. Um, I think, for me, the main thing is what you hit on early is the, um, the approach to public speech as an infrastructure for democracy. That, I think, is a remarkably original formulation that borrows from some of the interest in infrastructure that's circulating around the social sciences and anthropology that borrows from this tradition of Anderson and Habermas and, and Warner and, and Fraser and so forth, but that focuses on the speech aspect. And that is wholly original. And to do so in a historical manner that you know, you're, you're, re you're reconstructing speech events where you don't have the speeches themselves is uh, methodologically really brilliant. And I think it is um, both sort of the, the theoretical in intervention of bringing speech as infrastructure for the building of political subjects and uh, the methodological innovation of being able to do this through things like you know the shorthand taken by police who were there to spy on meetings and things like that um, and so he's bringing a whole set of methods to bear on something that people just hadn't paid attention to in this you know this split between the the platform and the press because the press was so much easier to to reconstruct in some respects um, and I think that's really, for me, that's uh, an innovation that that's, you know, we're going to be able to do a lot with that in other contexts. Anywhere in the world, actually, right? I mean, that's something that's an abstract contribution for anywhere. Anyone Ron else? Wasser, do you want to, do you want to, uh, I'm happy to jump in, but if you want to uh, give your point of view on the uh, conceptual contribution of the book. Yeah. I'm uh, a linguist by training. This gives me a new way of uh, looking at nation formation. So as a linguist, we were focusing on uh, the issues of um, identity in nation formation or imagination and things like that. And uh, this book brings out uh, what Barney calls um, the communicative um, infrastructure into uh, nation, um, uh, nation for, um, for I mean, that was uh, new to me for a, a student of um, social uh, linguistics. Uh, the other thing which I find as a, as a linguist is to have a relook on the notion of uh, modernity of uh, language. In general, um, in linguistics, um, the modernity of uh, language defined uh, uh, in terms of its written expressions, what new genres have come in and things like that. And this is the first time I see that uh, the new genres could be spoken and uh, that leads to, uh, to to uh, modernity. Uh, I would say that these are the main takeaways I had as a, as a uh, linguist looking at the book, not as an anthropologist or a political scientist. Um, for me, just to add on, I mean, those are, I think those are both uh, incredible contributions to this book. And, and by the way, thank you again, Sue, for, for the wonderful introduction and also to um, Lauren and Tulisi, um, and also to Barney's family, um, uh, some of whom are here. Um, but to add, I would add to that, that thinking about this book in relationship to Barney's first book, 
And there really is a through line um, between them and not just the topical. I mean, there's a topical through line. Barney's first book was also about stage oratory in the 20th century um, and the emergence of the of a speech style that was used on stage. And, and, and this first book was like the prehistory. In fact, if you go back to Barney's dissertation, I can't remember if it's an introduction or right at the end. And he says, and, you know, somebody needs to basically write a history of um, the prehistory of what I cover in this dissertation, and of course he went on he went on to do it. And so there's a conceptual continuity, but even more than that, I think speaking to what um, your your question Sue about the abstract or, or the theoretical contribution that has nothing to do in particular with South Asia, and the two things that really come to mind is, and that makes Barney's work very different from um, a lot of work in linguistic anthropology is on the one hand, a, a focus on the sensuous and the embodied quality of speech and the sensuousness of speech that really is part of what moves people. Um, and so how do we think about like the, the infrastructure of um, these kinds of embodied aspects of persuasive speech? And so, you know, a lot of the chapters in the book are really focusing on um, the poetic qualities, um, but also just frankly on on poets, uh, people like Bharatiyar, um, uh, on song, and on these in very interesting descriptions of what it felt like to be on the beach, surrounded by throngs of people in these meetings. So I think his attention to that, I think, is really important to remind us that, um, you know, that nation building has a, has a sensuous component. And that's why poets all over the world led nationalist movements, as he points out, in Africa, in South Asia. In, in Africa, Eastern yeah. Europe, in, in Eastern, Eastern Europe. Europe. I mean, this is one of the things that I noticed. So I was like a revelation. Oh, boy, it's happening. Yes, absolutely. And he puts that he puts his finger on that. And I think that is uh, that that translates. So the, the kind of the that, that aspect to it. And then the other is, I think, as Frank was saying, his historical focus that it's ethnographic, but um, his work was is always a, has an ethnographic sensibility. But this book is is very much the book of a, a historian working through the archives. And and what's amazing is putting those two things together. So how do you do a history of the sensuous nature of forms of speech that we have no records of? And I think the, the, the amazing thing about this book is that he does it. I mean, you read the book and you really start to feel like uh, you get a feeling for what um, speech felt like at this time and why it moved people. Um, and, and he's working, he's reading against the grain of these archives, as Frank was saying, he's reading police reports um, written in shorthand in translation about these um, speeches. So I think that, you know, thinking methodologically too, I think is a, a really big contribution to this book. How can we do um, a, a linguistic anthropology that is really historically um, sensitive, uses the methods of historians, but is alive to the theoretical concerns of of linguistic anthropology and, and political science. So for me, I think those are two, two really big takeaways. Uh, cool, absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more about each one. And actually I have some comments or, or questions about many of the things that you have uh, mentioned. Um, where is our, our fourth editor who I don't I think, actually I think, know? I, don't, I think Malaviri won't be able to join us for the time difference. She's, uh, I don't know if she's in India. I, yeah. I okay. see, okay, great. Great. Uh, so maybe I don't, since we have a little more time, um, how long should we go before um, people start to ask their own questions? Maybe till um, 545. Is that the idea? Yes. Oh, maybe a little more. So um, I, there are some of the things that I wanted to ask about. Um, I would be really curious to hear your sense before um, discussing um, uh, your process in doing this. And um, I wonder if you could comment on what Barney meant by modernity. Um, and um, he doesn't actually ever in the book define it as such, for which maybe I was grateful. Um, but he has, um, he, he has implications. And in particular, I think modernity and capitalism are often linked. And so another aspect of this question would be the presence or actually maybe the absence of capitalism in the book as a force, as a colonial presence. So um, the, the Tamil transform, political transformation from English speaking elites to a Tamil speaking mass politics, it's beautiful. Um, but then at various times, uh, so in new places, right? And that's really important, not temples, but the beach, not, um, not closed spaces, but um, the street. Um, 
uh, the the uh, interpolation of a universal man rather than a caste and so on. But then we have strikes in the mills, uh, Swadeshi movement, right? Very much an economic uh, movement. Suddenly the meetings are all about economics. And so I wonder if you, does this, just sneak into the book, or is this part of what he seems to think of as modernity, the presence of, of uh, a, a capitalist factory based actually mills um, uh, population that for more than for for this kind of um, uh, comes together. Um, uh, 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 with the with the um, the Tamil language and the ordinary, so I'm I'm just curious if you have things to say about that. I, I want Frank to answer that question, so I'm going to jump in actually to <laughs> to nominate him. But I also want to say that what's interesting is that when we were going through Barney's materials, um, he had notes on this question: how to think about modernity, and he had crowdsourced, as I remember, um, a bunch of inputs from people on Facebook. And he had this long list of all these different ways to think about modernity. And it, it really was very much on his mind. At, at the same time, it's interesting to think, you know, the title of this book is a call out to Weber. Um, but it, but capitalism does um, take a kind of a back seat as, as a main driver of the story. And I think, I don't want to speculate too much, but I think that that had something to do with the way in which Barney wanted to put emphasis on and attention to a long uh, durée of a certain kind of cultural aesthetics as, as also being the, the, the way to tell this story rather than it being kind of these universal categories coming from outside. Um, but I, I'll hand it over to, um, to Frank to, to speak also to this question about the, the, political, the political economic history around strikes and, and the Swadeshi movement. I mean, on the, on the question of how Barney was thinking about my journey, that was, I think what he was doing those months where he was wrestling with the introduction that never really got written as such. This was the big question that he was asking. Uh, there's, we have some notes that uh, indicate a, a possible conclusion title as we've never been, it's not the, we've never been modern, is it? I mean, is yeah, it exactly the, the we've never been public. That, or we've never been public, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's very cute, very cute. Going with the idea of urban public as a, as a way of kind of wrapping up the story. I mean, he was certainly very taken. I remember when he read Charles Taylor's book on modern social imaginaries as sort of, and both Charles Taylor and Sudipto Kaviraj's sort of explorations of, of modernity as, um, uh, I mean, for Sudipto Kaviraj is the phrase that you see appear in Barney's work a lot, this idea of a zero degree individual, an individual who's stripped of, of qualities um, and can be addressed as such in the abstract. Um, and I think this is something that has a lot to do with, and this is where the Weberian influence is. This, this, I mean, this, the sort of Protestant vision of what you know, Marx mocked the idea of the abstract man of Protestantism as perfect for capitalism in, in, in the first volume of Capital. Uh, but uh, you know, Weber and his heirs, in, in the form of Sudip Kaviraj and Charles Taylor and other thinkers like that, take that very seriously. Um, I think that's something Barney took very seriously as. A sort of ideological component of modernity, um, and not epiphenomenal to to the unfolding of capitalism, um, but it is uh, certainly around the question of uh, labor that that seems to be um, a flashpoint, right? Where it makes sense not only labor but consumption, right? Swadeshi was about actually consuming local products, okay. and so uh, this is something that I think he never thematized as such. Um, the question of capitalism, uh, in part because it had already kind of overtaken the discussion on print as the main kind of sort of form through which people experience national belonging and belonging to peoplehood. Um, and then I think it goes back to what you were pointing to earlier, the question of spiritual agency. Um, and that when that spiritual agency becomes so abstract as to be potentially all encompassing for him, that was a, a sort of a key component of thinking the modern more. Um, and it, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's both the Protestant vision of spiritual agency and it's the response that comes from the Shaivite tradition and, and the other things that he's documenting. And I think um, he took that very seriously. And I mean, there are a lot, a lot of Bible quotes in his notes um, that I think give us a clue as to how he was thinking about modern agency in, in very spiritual terms. 
You know, other thing that kind of occurs to me is, you know, thinking about modern ways of thinking about language is a big part of the book, too. And so the question of how is it that a certain form of language ideology linked to Protestantism appears. I mean, the other thing to say, too, about um, in local capitalism is that a number of the key players um, like VOC um, were, you know, uh, capitalists who are who are running shipping businesses and all sorts of other things. So. It's, it really is under the surface. I found, by the way, the notes, um, a number of people on this call actually were on the Facebook um, thread where Barney um, um, put a bunch of quotes that he was thinking about from Sheldon Pollock and uh, uh, Peter Vandeveer, um, Bruno Latour and others. Um, and he says, after he responds to everybody, he says, thanks everybody for your thoughts. I'm still at sea as one should be on this question, but your input is very helpful in several respects. Um, he says, the first that we'll be teaching a course called Modern Social Thought this coming semester, and it seems to me that we'll need to be as clear as we can about the lack of clarity about what this term means. Um, and the second, he said, he thanks somebody that says, the second point is that I'm trying to write these days on what we mean by political moder modernity, and I actually think there are truly new newnesses, to quote Sudipta Kaviraj, but hammering them down is, as we know, troubling. Um, and I, I, he puts more and I, I won't read it out, but it, I mean, I think you're right, Sue, to put your finger that this was something he was really struggling with about how to think about what really is new in this historical moment, because he was really concerned with what's not new too, what really has a long continuity for thousands of years um, in Tamil poetics and Tamil concepts of sovereignty. Um, and so where do we find what exactly is new about modernity? It's, I mean, I think you could see it. That's partly what's driving a lot of his work. You know, what's, yeah, what's, what's new about the old stuff and um, right, what's kind of right. old about the new stuff. Right. So one thing he doesn't get into, this is very interesting. Thank you for these clarifications. One thing that I found really interesting is that he talks about the new Tamil and he doesn't actually say much about it. But we know that that actually was happening at the same time from other writers, that Tamil was actually being transformed as a language, just to get to back to what uh, Anam Elisha was saying, that this was, this was becoming a different language. And um, I don't know if he wrote about it elsewhere, but it, he does gesture towards that. And I'm sure that that's one way to think about, in a, in a linguistic anthropological way, about what modernity could have meant um, here. So well, that's really interesting. Yeah, I think he, uh, I think he uh, links modernity with uh, democracy too, and with democracy he links it up with uh, individual sovereignty. And he talks about Tamil modernity. It is uh, what uh, uh, the Tamil used to uh, to the ordinary Tamil speakers, not between poets and, and things like that. And uh, uh, that is his uh, um, uh, idea of uh, uh, modern um, uh, uh, phenomenon of, uh, of Tamil in terms of it's uh, uh, used to uh, uh, to uh, to communicate with uh, uh, people in in a public sphere. Right? The public sphere always required uh, the high variety of Tamil, but um, uh, here you have a Tamil which is uh, uh, not uh, literary in one sense, but that's another question. See how the literary Tamil came to be used in public speeches. Exactly. That's one one thing about this. What the movie does, I think, in the first book, he puts his tries to put his finger on the the the, the squarely linguistic problem of you know what's the speech style, what are the register forms, and in this book, that the the shift I feel like he makes is that the question of linguistic modernity also has to do with who gets to who gets to hear speech, who gets to be addressed by speech, and that's why the turn to infrastructure is so powerful because linguistic modernity doesn't. It's not just about the speech forms, um, though the language is changing, but also, you know, where is it spoken? Um, who is being addressed by it? Um, who can take it up and use it? And, right. and all those questions are being undone in this historical, in this these newnesses. So even though it's the, sometimes it's the same old forms, you know, the same form of alliteration or the same register, the the, um, the, the old forms have been radically reconfigured because now it's being used to speak to uh, mill workers on a strike or something like that, not just okay. to a bunch of other elites in a, in a, in a cool right. hall right. In, a, in a big city or something like that. And on the beach and on the street, I mean, I was really taken by his discussion, a very vivid discussion about the meetings on the beach and so on. That was beautiful stuff. So um, something that you all have 
already brought up, but was very striking to me was the repeated emphasis on the creativity of poets and the importance um, to, oh, wait, no, no, before I, we get to poets, I have one other thing that I really wanna hear you talk about, which has to do with an analytical move that I think is really, really um, very useful to me, but I think to everyone, which is the question of how it is exactly that a Protestant homily or a genre of Protestant homilies can be transformed. Um, we don't want to have to talk about hybridity, we could. We can, don't have to talk about appropriation, though we could. Um, but it seems to come out of a contradiction that the acolytes of the Protestant mission didn't convert. <laughs> they did something else, they converted their speech or they converted their, their modes of communicating, but they didn't convert themselves to Protestants. And I thought that that was really, what, what I just said is kind of glib, but I think his description of taking apart what it is that people um, took from the Protestant homily and what they did with it was, is really uh, brilliant, just really brilliant and, and very helpful in the direction that you've all been saying that, that one has to specify what changed right? and, and who did that changing. And he does, he tells us about the specific poets who did particular things. So I, I, I would be, uh, I'd love to hear you talk about that aspect of the book and how you dealt with it in editing. That not hybrid, he didn't call it hybrid. He didn't call it appropriation, right? No, I'm not sure he called it anything, he, but he showed us how it happened. Yeah, I mean, the, it's a, the, 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 the idea that what was taken from is the form you know, he, he makes this distinction between the kind of the form and the content. And there's a kind of a form of Protestant speech that gets taken on um, and filled up with all sorts of other stuff. And I think, you know, that, you know, he was thinking about using different concepts from linguistic anthropology to think about how you can get these different reconfigurations where a form could get detached, in this case, from Protestant theology. Um, and instead, something else could kind of um, fill it up, as it were. In this case, it could be Saivite, a different kind of religious um, form of um, sermonizing, or eventually forms of political speech. Um, what's amazing is that, I, I don't know if your sense about this anomaly, sir, whether, I mean, I think he demonstrates quite um, strongly that this is the case, that historically this is where these genres come from. But I never occur, I never encountered anybody who ever describes speech, um, stage speech, as sounding Protestant. So it's also that the it also seems to me that the form is detached, but also some of the associations don't don't travel along with it. And so it, it doesn't have that hybrid feel where it's a little bit of this thing and a little bit of that thing. It's almost like almost like it just slips through history. I mean, and and it was it's quite jarring actually when you read the book and you realize that the deep history of this is coming from missionization because I mean, it never occurred to me, for example. Of course, right, right, right. I, no, think it's it, really, I think it's really true that uh, no Tamil listener of these uh, speeches thought that uh, they were listening to a sermon. Right? It's, uh, 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 it's a, a distinct uh, genre identity was maintained, not as a, as a, a sermon, but as a, uh, as a political uh, speech. And this kind of disassociation he does with the uh, classical uh, Tamil use in platform uh, speeches, right? The, the classical Tamil with all poetic embellishment were used for certain types of communication with uh, certain kinds of uh, people. But um, in the first book, he describes how that um, uh, embellished uh, language is used for this public conversation, a uh, public speech with the ordinary folks. So that's another dissociation he makes uh, uh, between um, the, uh, the, uh, the form of the language and the audience who would uh, uh, hear that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing. In, yeah. in addition yeah. to the form, I think it's, it's the ethos. And this is where he's very Vivarian. I mean, he's really interested in the ethos. This idea that you could go into a bazaar and just address people in general. 
was remarkably strange. As people, um, <laughs> okay. as like undifferentiated people. I don't, you know, I don't really care who you are. You are a potential, you know, you can be saved. That ethos that then, you know, gets unplugged from its religious origins and becomes generalized as the basis upon which politics can be done. That's a huge story. Um, and it's, it's one that, you know, if you, if you look at contemporary politics, you would have no idea. You would have, I mean, and, you know, at some point in the introduction, he says, what I'm about to say is kind of wildly offensive to people to think that this is brand new and it comes from Protestantism. It's not inherent to the Tamil people. And I mean, the, he, you know, he knows he's treading on, on kind of dangerous territory and saying that this is an ethos that is profoundly strange to the people who first encountered it, but nevertheless seem to have a very sort of attractive quality to it in terms of enabling forms of of belonging and subjectivity that that really had legs and that's that's where the modernity the modernity is the other side of it too is the idea that that's also it's not offensive but it's shocking is the idea that um every, that people in all times and all spaces didn't speak like this that um that there wasn't this kind of public speech uh before this moment and so this idea that like the king never speaks um, the Tamil sovereign doesn't speak. Other people speak to him or for him, but he doesn't address anybody. And um, I think that, you know, maybe for many anthropologists, that's not shocking, but I think within the, with thinking about political theory, um, yeah. you know, that this is, this is also um, something that, th th these are not universals, right? That he's describing. They, they are, as Sue was saying, they have a contingent history. Um, yeah. So for both sides, it's kind of it's kind of shocking, I think, for a Tamil speaker, but it's also shocking, I think, for a kind of a kind of a from the view of political theory, political science, that um, you know, sovereigns don't necessarily try to represent anything to their to the to the to those who they putatively um, stand yeah, in yeah, or rule yeah. over. Yeah, and in fact, um, just to add a, a little um, historical moment that doesn't actually belong here, but that's one of the things that apparently made Elizabeth the I very powerful, that she did not act, actually come out with, I mean, she spoke obviously in her everyday life, but she didn't come out with, um, with decisions and, um, and policies. Um, she let them swirl around her. And so in a very, very different context, it might be helpful to think, uh, to think Barney, in the history of of um, of uh, uh, British uh, monarchs, right? So that that's but that's I, I think that his work really lends itself to um, opening up other historical situations, even though it's so beautifully embedded in the Tamil situation. So the last question I had before I ask you to tell us about how you put this book together is just the one about the poets. I I was just completely um, jaw drop. Oh, of course, we've known Eastern Europeans know that poets are so important, but not why. Nobody has ever questioned the, the, the political, uh, the, the, the centrality of in every single national movement, there's been a major poet. Um, and it's like, of course there is. <laughs> but this lets you think about why that would be the case. And that seems to me to be an enormous contribution. Um, and so I'm interested in hearing you can, your um, sense of that and, and, his, um, and his engagement with Tamil poetry in general. Well, I mean, Actually, vernacularization, thing, right? Yeah, I mean, one thing that's interesting just thinking about Barney's training is, you know, that he worked with Ramanujan, A.K. Ramanujan, the great um, linguist and folklorist, but also wrote uh, and was translating poetry with Ramanujan, and then also with Paul Friedrich, who was also a poet, or uh, styled himself a poet, and, and wrote poetry, and also and wrote about the poetic uh, qualities of language. And, you know, I, I think that that, and I don't know if that's something that Barney brought with him to Chicago, or he got here at Chicago, but it, it shines through in his work. And I think, but you know, I think exactly. Just to, I'm just repeating what you're saying, Sue. That I think a lot of times we say, yeah, of course, they're they're not they're poet laureates, and there's you know they're they're poets who go along with nationalism as if they were kind of on the side, and maybe they they provide some um, kind of paraphernalia to some other real story that's going on somewhere else. But for Barney, that is the story. I mean, and that's what's the that's what's driving history here. 
and it, the, the, the politician is a poet in, in the 20th century in Tamama. Um, and I think that, you know, looking at how that, how those two things um, can overlap with each other is another eye-opening one to re revisit any number of um, situations where um, the, the major national leaders were, of course, um, doing uh, poetry of one kind or another, um, right. either within the genre or, um, or, or were, were moving history through, their, through the, the, the capacity of their words to persuade. Absolutely, uh, and journalists as well, but that's not so far away from poetry ultimately, um, although it does get us back to print, <laughs> but still it's the poets. Um, I, I've always wondered about that. Um, and so this, is, this really gives you a great, um, well, so um, uh, could you please speak a little bit about how you put the book together so that then we can get to, um, to other people's questions. This is a big job. Why did you even do it? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to think, I'm thinking back. So Barney passed in 2016 and all this stuff was in Stanford, right? Is that right? Uh, or uh, where he was staying in California. Right, and, it was in his computer there. Yeah, it was in his computer. And, and Whitney Cox on this call um, was instrumental in, in, um, in getting the materials uh, as were, were Noah and Kijo. And then the question was what to what to do about it, and I don't remember how we we caught the hot potato, but um, but we did. And uh, actually, it, this was one of the most I, I don't I don't want to speak for Frank and Anomaly, but it was one of the most um, satisfying collaborations um, to work with colleagues on this project because I think we just worked really well together. We had a, a great division of labor. Um, Malitaviri was um, very instrumental at the beginning by going through all of the materials and, and figuring out what was there and what was the newest, um, what were notes that were kind of hanging off. Um, every talk Barney gave, he recapitulated the book. So we had all of these different versions across time of how he imagined the book, which was helpful. Um, it, it, could, it was also, sometimes I think we wished maybe there was just one <laughs> with the last date that was the final one, but um, and then we, um, after we figured out what was there and what needed to be done, I feel like we just, we, we circulated everything in rounds. We each took a turn of working through a text, commenting on it, um, and just kind of proceeded um, in that way. And I don't know, I mean, I, I, I think it, worked, we, it was a pretty seamless uh, editorial process, I thought. I think the main challenge was to keep Barney's voice in the book, yeah. right? Because four people, four of us were speaking, and we had to take care that it's not our voice. I, I, I don't know. I think the readers will have to tell whether they hear Barney's voice in the book. Yeah, I think one of the things that made a big difference was that um, so many of these were taken straight from talks that he gave. And so you really retained the the quality of address that, and he, I mean, he already had that in his writing. If you, even if you read his dissertation, he had this way of writing that was, um, he was composing something to, to, to be addressed to people orally. Um, and that was then transcribed. Um, that, was, that was his writing style. But I think there was something about the fact that these are, you know, a series of talks that he gave. And so you got the synopsis of the book and then you got how this part fit in relationship to it that made it, possible to, to, to work together to, to kind of cut and paste it such that I would say with the exception of a couple sentences there's not a single part of it that was composed by us you know there were a few kind of gaps we had to 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 fill in but um, it's very much all Barney's work um, and, and his words chosen as he would have chosen them um, and just combined as we saw fit um, which was that really required all four people to, to work closely together, which was, it was very therapeutic. I mean, after, after losing a friend like that, to, to be able to, uh, to revive his words uh, as a group, I, I found it very, uh, it helped me. Uh -huh. and, uh, to, to, to... Like a bullet point. And then we would go back through his old notes and say, okay, what was he thinking about here? And then we would find it. And then there would be like, you know, there would be something. And, um, and so that was, you know, just like Frank and Nama I said, I think keeping keeping his voice was important. Um, I think the biggest challenge was redundancy, though, because um, because 
every talk for every chapter had the had the whole thing kind of enveloped around it. So, you know, uh, making it um, flow as a book. But that was more kind of sculpting away than, you know, adding things in. You just had to kind of pull out the right things and make sure they were at the right time in the book. Yes, that's one of the things that I noticed that it really flows and um, and that it must have been difficult to come to some sort of d decision about the um, ordering of things that that seemed like something that was um, uh, deftly done. And so all I can say is uh, uh, thank you again. Uh, I can't believe that you you must have volunteered for this like nobody came around with a shotgun. So no. No, we volunteered for it, yeah. So, we were honored uh, to do it. I mean, it was, I think we were all happy to do it. And we wanted it. We wanted the book to come out. I mean, um, Barney had um, presented a number of the chapters at this annual workshop that we do here that Frank and Anama and I have all been part of over the years. And, you know, I mean, you see, you, we saw the project develop. I mean, it just would have been so tragic and terrible if it didn't come out. And, uh, right. Well, I definitely agree. And that, as I said, that you've done a great service um, uh, to the discipline and to the disciplines, many disciplines, because I do think that a political science needs to read this as well. I hope we can get them to do so in addition to linguistics and anthropology. Um, so um, unless people have other things that they'd like to add, I mean, I've pretty much organized this. So you might want to say some things that I haven't asked about. Did you want to say some things? That Oh. I think we can open it up to the conversation. There are lots okay. of old friends and colleagues of Barney's. Here. Yeah, yeah, by all means. Um, so how do we do this? I think you can you can raise your hand or um, or put up the the um, you know the hand uh, logo. I see that um, Pancho Bait um, have put in something in the chat. Maybe we could just start off with that. Let's and, uh, see. I love this discussion and that so many brilliant people are thinking deeply about the importance of language, political rhetoric in particular. Barney died at the beginning of the rise of Donald Trump, an enormous tragedy and loss on so many levels. Would any of the panelists care to comment on these idea, uh, ideas of infrastructure of communication, policy, and modernity applied to what happened and continues to happen in the US? So uh, thank you very much for that comment question. Um, I. Um, I was hinting at that at the very beginning that everybody should read this for uh, the for its possible as something to think with for um, for the American situation, and I would be delighted to hear comments anybody wants to make. I mean, I'm sure he was his blood would have been boiling. It already was, I think. I, mean, <laughs> I remember talking with him about what was going on, and maybe that's the you know that's the other side to think about. Um, nation building and political rhetoric is the, um, Barney uses this phrase, the demon of Ande Madram, and he connects it with um, Durkheim, who talks about, the, is it the demon of oratory? I can't remember what um, Durkheim's phrase is. But you know, Durkheim is also has this vision of, of a kind of a democratic society and solidarity um, through communal rituals. And then in the elementary forms, um, gestures to, you know, um, uh, mob psychology. And he he, he says it. Yeah. yeah. And so I think that's, you know, that's something to think about, too, that, you know, in, in this book, the story is about a people being interpolated and it's in a social movement that um, was driven by, by and large, um, ideologies of um, social justice and social welfare. And so in the Tamil case, this story, I think, um, has generally positive and democratic connotations. This is how dem democracy played itself out. But um, you know, the other side of it would be, you know, what is going on in India today, uh, but also in the United States and in, and in other places as well. Mm -hmm. It seems to me another, um, yeah, I don't totally agree with what you just said, Kostas. And I also think that another thing that's worth thinking about, again, uh, suspending positive or negative or where we stand on it, is the relationship between so-called spiritual, religious, and political matters, which are... Um, are I think also very much um, in our faces these days, um, and and we need more ways to think about them. And the, the sort of backdrop of contemporary politics that I think is important to think about here is a figure like Billy Graham, 
um, and and you know to be able to address people at that scale. And I, Billy Graham died about a year and a half after Barney, and I remember thinking, boy, that was that was part of the story that Barney was telling. Um, and that certainly is, you know, I think an important sort of infrastructural foundation, if we want to use his language, for the world in which we're living now, um, which has taken you know, postmodern forms that we could never have imagined before. Exactly what I was thinking. Yes, exactly. Any there are anti aesthetics, though, too. I mean, the, what's interesting about someone like Trump, but also about the mediation of political discourse now through things like Twitter and other social media is that. I mean, it, it, there's obviously a poesy to it, um, but it has a, it, it is almost anti-rhetorical at times, um, though it's rhetoric all the same. Um, and the infrastructure of communication, it still involves huge rallies, as we know. I mean, that was a big part of what was going on, but it also involves other things that were not that are not the press or the platform. Um, you know, fake news stories being pushed through social media. And there's a whole other story about infrastructure here um, that I think Barney actually has a lot to say about, but but the historical moment is just so different. Right? And the peculiarities now. Yes, indeed. And I think that, you know, the term that you might want to add there might be entertainment. Um, uh, there, there's, a, there's something else in the mix, but um, but I do think that, that reading Barney can be very helpful in um, in thinking about it. I hope to be able to to do some of that definitely but that is part of the story that he doesn't he alludes to but doesn't quite tell which is that there was also a lot of entertainment going on in this in this uh i mean theater song and then into the 20th century of course cinema as the other great mobilizer of the same um uh or, or related aspects of the same uh, of the ethno-linguistic kind of political movement so right. spectacle yeah. definitely right. definitely yeah. I, think, I think barney is consistently with how uh the uh, public speakers or through their speech uh, uh, lead people. I mean, he, he doesn't take up the question of how uh, these speeches mislead people, see, which is a problem in modern political speeches. Right. I think that's an entirely new project. There is, I mean, this is good. I don't want to get into a very narrow regionalist conversation, but I wonder, I, I always wonder what Barney would think about um, some of the, of the of a new kind of Tamil chauvinism and nativism that has appeared in, on the scene at, at, at the same time. I mean, it's not for the same reasons exactly, but at the same time as what's going on on the global scale. So you have these politicians like Seaman, who are great orators, um, but their politics is not social justice exactly. It's not exactly the social welfare that Barney was talking about. And um, yeah, they you know th th these kinds of tools are can can just as well be used for anti-democratic politics as well. I think we have Elizabeth Bate. Let me see if I can get the, um, the chat. Isabel Bate asks everyone, could you briefly talk about his theoretical foundations and how they show up in the book, how they ground his research? I'm curious about how his thinking developed and the political and linguistic theorists he's in conversation with. By all means, I think that's a great, um, great, great question. Um, I, I there, there's certain ones I noticed, uh, even when they were incited. Um, but please, um, those of you who are the editors, please tell us more. Frank, you want to take this one? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a long list. We have the, the, the background in, in linguistic anthropology, um, uh, the, the question of, of sort of the study of poetics from the tradition of Roman Jakobson and, and this tradition of, of semiotics that gets taken up in anthropology, I think is a, is a very important foundation. This book also owes a lot to historical sociology. And we were very fortunate to have Sudipto Kaviraj give the afterward to the book. Because I mean, I think Sudipto Kaviraj was one of the kind of major interlocutors for Barney's thinking about what colonial modernity is um, and, and how to think of it on that scale. Um, so, I mean, I think this is, he, he, th this is, it's a bit less evident in his first book than in this one, that he really wants to speak to uh, political theorists and, 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 and uh, this big tradition in sociology, which is interested in, in the question of, of democratization and what, what that might look like. Um, and so he's, he's reaching out a bit beyond, I think, the, the question of, of language here. Language is kind of a way to approach this really big question about modernity itself. And that, that's what connects Sudipta Kaviraj, who he often calls them a modern day Weber. Um, and that's the kind of tradition he saw himself working in. 
it's a fabulous afterword, which is really helpful in placing the book itself. So that I, I'm, I'm actually wondering how you got him to do it. He was very fond of Barney. They used to hang out when Barney was teaching at Columbia University. That's great. That's wonderful. I would add to that, um, I, you know, I guess because I'm situated in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Chicago, I see those those stripes coming out of Barney's work. And I always thought of him as mediating two different, they were not exactly camps, but just two different ways of thinking about um, language and history. So on the one hand, there's kind of Marshall Solins and Jim Fernandez um, uh, and, and Paul Friedrich. And on the other hand, um, there's Michael Silverstein, who Barney's also thinking with and trying to bring together with Paul Friedrich's work. And then there's a, that deep endological tradition um, at Chicago. Um, Kim Marriott, I remember when Barney came out um, for one of the, the, to give it one of the talks for the Tom Four, I remember Kim came out to dinner um, with us. Um, and of course, Ramanujan. And, um, and so that, that also leads me to the other thing to say that what was really interesting about how Barney worked is that I think that he really was committed to the idea of thinking with um, um, so-called native um, Tamil intellectuals and really thinking with them. So, you know, he, um, he draws a lot from um, Chalapati's, A.R. Venkata, Venkata Chalapati's work, but also um, Toho Paramasivan. And so I think he was really trying to also bring all of that together to really think what, what are the imminent political linguistic theories that can also be taken out of the Tamil tradition and put into conversation. So I think that's another kind of thread of his thinking that, that, that he took very seriously. Um, I think that's hugely important. And it's hugely important for those of us who might want to take it further, right? to remember that it isn't just um, Weber and Durkheim and uh, et cetera, add, add your, your flavor of the, of the political theory, but it really is also the, the South Asians who were think, whose names I will not try to pronounce, who were also thinking um, about these things and, um, and who, have, who have very important um, uh, observations and, and, and theories to add to, um, to the Europeans. Yeah, the term used uh, to describe uh, Barney among some Tamil circles uh, uh, tells, uh, I mean, brings out this aspect. I mean, he's called uh, the adopted son of Tamil community. That's great. That's great. Yeah, Barney was very legendary for his, as, as a speaker, actually, um, not just a speaker of Tamil, but as an orator and uh, uh -huh. um, well, that's very helpful to know. That's a really interesting insight. Wow. Yeah. And presenting some of this research in Tamil in, in Madurai, which is not something all of us could do as, as deftly. Yeah, this entry into Tamil, in my experience, is different from many generations of students I taught uh, Tamil. I mean, Everybody has a different reason to enter uh, into Tamil. Bonnie once told me that um, uh, what uh, helped him or what uh, forced him to enter into Tamil is uh, a lyricist called, I mean, composer, film compo composer called Iraya Raja. I mean, he, he, he listened to the uh, film songs and then were attracted to Tamil. This is uh, uh, not any scholarly way of uh, entering into um, uh, into uh, Tamil. So, um, and also from uh, his um, uh, uh, interaction with um, uh, Tamil, I think he transcended uh, professional relationship with Tamil to personal relationship with Tamil. I think that made a big difference. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, certainly. Must have. <laughs> The Ilya Raja story he told me as well, and I was thinking of that when you're asking about the role of the of the poet. I mean, I think that's where he comes to the scholarship is from the love of the language, and I think that's it, something that is, I think marked a lot of us who came to anthropology through mentors like like Barney. Um, where I mean, anthropology is a place where you might be able to sort of pursue your love of of a language or something like that, and that that I think is is very important in sort of motivating his research. I'm very glad you said that because I was hoping somebody would say something like that, which is implied in some of the uh, some of the book. That's great. Oh, um, 
So many he, film stars. He are... sometimes writes like almost like a literary critic. I mean, he um, when when he describes some of the poetics of the works, it's in admiration. I mean, that he had that kind of voice that he could move from a kind of detached analysis and then to to, to turn around and say, just look how beautiful this is, you know, like just listen to it. Um, and I think that comes out in different ways. In, in, yeah. In yeah, his yeah. in and when you would interact with him, of course, but. Um, it does, I think Frank is right, um, say, Frank is right to say it, it does or, orient his work and it's there uh, in it. Thank you. Anybody else? Please? You could also simply um, speak if you raise your hand, but the chat is available as well. It might be that people have not yet had a chance to read the book. Oh, Andrew um, Holland. I'm sorry. Um, I see a hand. And, oh, there. Okay. Mr. Ollett, I'm sorry. I don't know you, but please speak. Hi. Uh, Hi. I know you, however, uh, because uh, I was introduced to your work uh, by Barney. Uh, so, oh, how I, nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I just wanted to say, just uh, if, following something that, that Costas just said, the, the kind of uh, his admiration for uh, for poetry is, is also, you know, he has a, this quality that I've never seen in anyone uh, in the same way, which is an admiration for scholarship too. And his, you know, uh, absolutely unique generosity in engaging with all kinds, kinds of scholarship and really trying to find the, the, the most useful and interesting thing and trying to see how it's going to push our own work forward. I think that was something that, uh, you know, I, I see in the, the new book, but, um, you know, something that I learned from him, like I, I'm in, on the Indological side and, um, and uh, Barney, um, you know, the way that he, so I didn't know what the significance of my work was uh, until Barney pointed it out uh, to me. And I think this is probably, um generally true that uh that he's he's able to you know in uh when I, so i studied with him at uh, at columbia um a while ago and um so in that case it was he was thinking about uh, these arguments about uh, aesthetics and how aesthetics enters into the political but not just uh, but, but specifically thinking about pre-modern indic uh conceptions of the aesthetic and um and think how to think of them in ways that are not just negative categories. So the aesthetic is what is non-political, the aesthetic is what is, and, um, and he was able to push that constructively in, in a way that uh, I think is uh, extremely valuable. So I just wanted to, to say that. And also I just wanted to thank the, the four editors uh, for, for this book, which is a real gift, thank you. Yeah, I do not know of any Western Tamil scholar who can sing like Barney the, uh, the cinema lyrics, right? <laughs> That's great. The Pancho Bate, who looks a lot like Barney, actually. <laughs> I'm looking at you. Anyone else? While we're while we're waiting for um, for someone to think, because these, it's difficult to to think about things you want to um, to say or or ask. Uh, is there anything that the that the three editors who are present would like to add? Because we've been sort of um, moving around the book, but there might be other things that um, that you find um, important to add. It oh. actually looks like Pancho has a question. Please yes, it looks like Pancho has a question. Please, please speak. I, I don't, thank you so much. I just, I don't want to, I don't really have a question. I mean, I have many questions. This is all extremely uh, thoughtful and obviously you, you're all very thoughtful people and uh, Barney was clearly a thoughtful person. Uh, I just want to thank everybody and just uh, on behalf of all the family. This is a 
this is great to see so many people that were affected by by his work and so thanks for putting this together so my admiration for uh, for me as a, as a scholar is uh, how he uh, doesn't uh, let his subjectivity about Tamil into his analysis of things Tamil. He is very subject. He's a very subjective person when it comes to Tamil. Kind of emotional attachments and things like that. But uh, he was able to keep the objectivity of analytical research from, from that. But I think you can feel some of those things in, in his analysis as well, right. in, a, in, a, in a positive way, not in a negative way. Really. Thank you. Uh, what about Whitney Cox and then Sonia? Um, thank you, Sue. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on and echo a couple of things. Um, and uh, was I mean, I've, I've told this story before in, in the company of some of you about, you know, for being a, a pre-modern, a scholar of pre-modern Palmer and having Barney be my teacher and my friend and how we, uh, how I kind of forced him to read medieval Tamil with me. And he, um, and at first he kind of like, he, I mean, it, you, you could, there's so much that you could see of this, uh, you know, as you were saying, as you all were saying so well about the sensual quality of it and just his love for the language, just getting sucked into it and really feeling it um, until in the end, because Barney was such a sort of, yeah, such an emotional, passionate man. I mean, of just sort of, you know, standing on chairs in the in classrooms and declaiming things. And, um, but <laughs> Another point I wanted to pick up about this was um, actually in response um, to Pancho Bates' great question earlier. I remember being in a very different, well, in a different and at the time equally um, frightening political dispensation in you know, 2000 through 2004 um, during the first term of the Bush administration and the run up to the, to, to the war in Iraq. And, um, and I remember, and I, I remember going into, I think it was probably the 2004 election with him and talking to him about the political conventions. And he was so kind of preoccupied by them. And there was an amazing thing with Barney that, I mean, this, this is the point I wanted to make about, you know, the recent political history of the United States is that for all that he was this man of just like deep feeling, I mean, deeper feeling than anyone I've ever known in my life. Um, he was able to kind of step back and have this remarkable analytical kind of colder eye that he could take to um, to things like talking. I mean, to um, the the state of to the I mean the the to the actual to speak of to return to speak of like anti aesthetics in the spirit of what Costas was saying earlier. You know, to sort of say to sort of sit and say, no, look, let's you know really look at a speech by George W. Bush and think about what it is to be able to take it apart to think about it and. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, of the hundreds of reasons I have for missing Barney to have him as someone to really be uh, um, a critic and an oppositional figure in the last, in the last years in America um, was something I really missed. And um, I can hope that in the spirit of what you all were saying and what um, Sue was saying about the effect this could have in fields beyond, you know, South Asian studies or linguistic anthropology, um, the ability to read the political that Barney, you know, has given to the world is something that, yeah, I can only hope that as many people as possible can, you know, can, can learn to do. Um, thanks, guys. This was really wonderful. Thank you. And Sonia, thank you, Whitney. Sonia? Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, it was a beautiful book. Uh, I also want to say that Barney was someone who uh, helped me figure out what the main point of my, uh, my, my research was about when I first submitted my first article um, to JLA and, and then my second one as well. So my second piece of writing. So I, I just have such enormous um, respect and admiration and, and affection for him. Um, I, I was reading this book as a Bengali uh, who does Tamil studies. And so I found it super interesting, particularly the afterword by Shudipto Kaviraj, but also um, some of the details, I thought Barney's attention to detail was, was, was incredible. And um, I was struck by how um, during, during the, um, the chapters on the Swadeshi movement, how Bipin Chandra Paul was considered a, a hero to Tamilians and how they celebrated his release from prison and how that was sparking um, many of the different kind of public gatherings. Um, did he, did, was he interested in this confluence between Indian and Tamil nationalism and democracy? To what extent is this a book, not just about the Tamil modern 
but more broadly about what was going on in India at that time, at that specific, well, the different periods of time that he's talking about. Were there other examples of other nationalist leaders being honored in the same way in Tamil speeches? And so what could you say more broadly about this being not just a movement of Tamil mass democracy, but about Indian mass democracy in the early 20th century? I had the, the same question in, in mind, so I'm really glad that you're asking it. Yeah, it's a fabulous question. I think Anamai and Sarah and Frank probably um, could speak more eloquently to it, but I, it's right that every chapter um, involves players who are beyond just the local um, scene. I mean, so the, the stuff about at the end of the book, for example, on um, the strikes involve, you know, the, the, the Theosophical Society in Wadia and um, people who are not, um, who don't come to dominate the political scene later. So I think it very much is a story of Indian nationalism from the perspective of this region. Um, and, and, you know, even in some of the discussions, this was, of course, before the splitting of Tamil Nadu as a state. So the, the circuits that these, some of these guys were moving through include what are now modern day Andhra Pradesh and, um, so I think it's 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 a it's an astute observation that it's not just the Tamil story that he's that he's telling, and there are all sorts of interesting connections that are going on, like with Bengal in particular. Um, right. I mean, I think in response, I think it's important to look at the title. It's the social imaginary in South Asia. He's making a, a South Asia wide claim that maybe is not fully substantiated in, in the text of the book, but it's it's certainly the kind of claim he wanted to make about the transformation of the political imaginary. In the details of the book, you get a picture of Madras as a polyglot city, something that you know, we, you know, we don't, because of the sort of monoglot imagination of, of the modern nationalist movements across the, you know, across the world, it's, it's hard to imagine that, but that's what it is and what it was. And it's something that was very explicit at that point in time in people's discussions of what political meetings were like. In the opening scene, is um, a, a satyagraha that's been called by Gandhi, right? And people are speaking in Urdu, in Telugu, in English, and in Tamil. Um, and that's just how it was. And I think that's an important part of the story that he's telling. And I think that's why he was so interested in you know, these earlier histories of forms like the bhajan, which is you know, a, a Marathi form that gets taken up by Tamil Brahmins and then becomes kind of a national emblem of Tamil nationhood through the, the songs of Bhartiya. Um, and I think that's a really important part of the story that you put your finger on. The flip side of two is also the other side where um, is the story of Sri Lanka and at Jaffna, uh, what becomes Sri Lanka and the movement of someone like um, Navalar, um, which is, it becomes extra national at some point, right? As Sri Lanka becomes a different um, nation state. But that's also a big part of the story. Those, those circuits from Jaffna into, into Madras and the way in which, in, in, in that case, it's also about print housing. I think, you know, Navalar is also coming up that way to print his books and things like that. And so that there's all sorts of movements going on that far outstrip the modern day imagination of the, the state lines. Yeah, the lexical level you can find in the Tamil speeches, uh, the uh, words like Vande uh, Madaram or Jay or so many other other words and reference to personalities like Tilak and all those things were there in the Tamil speech. I think this is a really important point again for political scientists, um, for, um, for sociologists who really have no sense of the range of variation um, even now of, of, um, of the forms of politics in the world that involve um, many languages um, side by side, uh, people being mobilized nevertheless, and so on, right? Who, who, who um, project back the current national monoglot um, circumstances. Um, Norma, you're next. Hi, thank you. Thank you, everybody. What a wonderful and moving discussion of this book. Um, I uh, had known and had read Barney's work for a while, uh, but then really became much more familiar with it through my colleague, Jennifer Jackson, who mm -hmm. was his student um, and admired him very, very much and uh, 
loved him very much. And she also uh, passed away in an untimely way. But so this is a, a sort of question in the spirit of, of both of them because they both worked in language and politics. And one thing uh, that strikes me about uh, his discussion of aesthetics uh, was his take up of the term rasa. And um, at, at one point, I think around page like 100 plus or something, he talks about one of the speeches um, or poems having a, a rasa of erotics. And it really meant more like not really erotics, but what, or what we would consider erotic, but more uh, like kind of playful. And, and thinking about the ways in which some of these speech situations have these um, evocations of feelings. Um, um, so for instance, uh, Adam Hodges and others have written about Trump that his, um, his rallies uh, feel like, uh, what is that called? Like uh, the, the fighting, you know, the, like the male wrestling. on male wrestling. fighting. Like wrestling. Yeah, that, that, that stuff. Yeah, so the, the sort of, um, the idea that uh, some of these oratorical styles evoke these rasas or feelings through which you uh, acquire almost like a new kind of interpretive framework for, for the speech um, event itself. So I was wondering if you, who are more well-versed in rasa, obviously, than I, uh, could help me understand um, what that meant and how we might apply it uh, beyond the South Asian context. Thank you. Please, answers from our, from our panelists. And I think uh, we have a note here that this one has to be the last answer <laughs> before we close the uh, event. Anyone? Yeah, I mean, uh... In the Indian literary uh, tradition, um, uh, creation of uh, raza in the readers is a uh, significant function of literacy. What Bonnie does is to shift that uh, uh, literary theory to political speeches. Yeah, and that was a move that Barney often made is to try to show the very deep cultural roots of some phenomenon that seems totally modern. And so, I think the evocation of a very traditional literary understanding of the of the pragmatics of poetic speech to create a, a kind of a set of feelings, an erotic feeling, a playful feeling, um, any number of feelings as the kind of the function. Um, you know, he's making that move, and I also think he's making the move. It's a it's a kind of a nod to the move that Jakobsen makes when he says the poetic function. You can find it in a scientific treatise. You can find it in a newspaper. You can find it in, in a political speech. And I think exactly what Anomalies are saying is Barney was saying, you can think about um, indigenous aesthetic theories that run not just in literature, but all the way through social life. You can hear it on the street, um, you know, in the, in the, in the kind of the, the tune of somebody um, announcing a meeting or, or trying to sell something or on the stage. So I think, you know, that's, that was a kind of a signature move that Barney made many times. Um, um, in the first book, it's, I, I guess, from his readings with Whitney, is thinking about medieval Tamil grammatical traditions as a way to describe 20th century uh, politics. And so yeah. and that's his historical, you know, trying to really show the deep history of some of these things. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I mean, it's not only aesthetic theory from Tamil literary tradition, but he also uses uh, grammatical theories from Tamil traditional grammar. One thing he uses in his first book is the notion in Tamil grammar, which is, it goes by the name Agupaya, which is basically how the words um, uh, have layers of uh, uh, meaning. I mean, it's a transferring of, from one meaning to to uh, to um, uh, other, and he makes use of that, how meanings are created in the political uh, uh, speeches, right? So <clears throat> that is um, clearly using uh, uh, traditional Tamar theory of uh, <clears throat> a semantic layering into his analysis of uh, political communication. Oh, that, that, that's terrific. 
thank you, everybody. Um, I think we have to end our, um, our wonderful Zoom room um, discussion. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, the, the editors of the book, um, for doing it. Everyone, I think, agrees that this was a real gift to us, to, uh, to scholarship, um, and to Barney in, in, in retrospect, um, definitely. So um, thank you. Go out, everybody, and read the book. It's fabulous. <laughs> and congratulations to those of you who created it.